All right, welcome back. Shh. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, any questions before we get started? Okay, a brief note, I emailed you earlier. Uh, I have to be out of town on the 13th, so we don't have class on that day. If you go to the syllabus, I've updated everything. Uh, so on the 13th, we'll not have class. Uh, this won't affect your schedule. I built in a, a make update at the end. We'll just use that one so we will still finish on time. Nothing delayed. Okay. Any objections? <coughs> okay. All righty. Um, anything else in your mind? Okay. We are starting a new topic today, right? And let's do a brief overview of where we've been. Um, in the very first class, we talk about acquiring land through discovery or conquest. And then we discussed acquiring animals in nature through the capture doctrine. And then we discussed property in yourself. That is property that you create with your hands, what you might call intellectual property, and even property in your own body that is your own cells. And in last class, we talked about our favorite metaphor, the bundle of sticks, this notion that property can mean different things. And that property includes what's known as the right to exclude others from your property. All right, so far it's all about finding stuff that doesn't really belong to anyone else. <coughs> Today we move on to a different topic which is finding stuff that does belong to someone else. Specifically, what you might call lost property, or what you might call mislaid property, or what you might call forgotten property. These are all labels we use throughout today's class. And what you'll find is that finders keepers um, isn't necessarily the rule. You know, that's we always taught as kids, finders keepers, losers weepers, right? Not Exactly, and the rules are very complicated. And I promise you, at the end of today's class, you'll be befuddled, you'll be confused. And Josh, what the heck is the rule? I'm gonna tell you now, there are different rules, right? You read a couple cases today that seem to go in all which directions. Even one case doesn't make up its own mind. Um, get used to it, this is property. Um, you have different judges in different countries making rules. Josh, what's the majority or what's the minority rule? I can't give you that as cleanly as I know you want it. You have to know all these rules. And Josh, what about the exam? Okay. Uh, for the exam, right, you have to look at the facts given in the question and say, what case is this most similar to? Is this like the brooch case? Is this like the case with the rings buried in the mud puddle, right? Um, you have to decide which case is most similar to your facts. It's not as simple as a majority minority rule, not with this topic at least. So there are several rules today. There's cases, there are cases within cases you have to know, and I think we'll go through them as carefully as we can. Go with me? Okay, I, I gave you fair warning, because I know this class particularly gives students a bit of a loop, especially at the end, it's like, oh my God, Josh, what's the rule? Well, I gave you warning, okay. Let's start with a question, simple yes or no, A or B. A loses his watch. B finds it. Who has a stronger claim to the watch? Okay, take about 30 seconds. Another 10 seconds or so. <sighs> okay, I think I just put everyone in. All right, uh, where did I left off last time? Kelsey, you're next. Yeah. Well, Kelsey, let me ask you just a, a threshold question, right? I said here, who has a stronger claim? What does that mean, stronger claim? What does that phrase mean, you think? Well. What we read today said that property is a relationship between other people, oh. not just like 
me owning this water bottle or something. That's, that's very good, right? And I, I think I like the way she explained that. Um, property is not an absolute ownership, right? It's not I own this phone. It's I have a claim to this phone that's pretty strong. I bought it. Kelsey has a claim to that water bottle because she bought it. But in property, at least in this class, different people have different claims to the same item. Right? So Yancy, let me ask you a question, please. What is A's claim to the watch? What would, what would A's argument be that that's my watch? He's the true owner of this watch. Okay. People love saying true owner. What does that mean, true owner, in this case? Yeah, I guess that's the original possession. Okay. W was he the, did he build the watch? No. Did he manufacture it? No. I mean, these aren't in the facts, but where do you think he got it from? He probably bought it. He bought it. Maybe inherited it. Maybe he, he stole it. We don't know, right? But all we know in this question is, who had it first, Yancy? A or B? A. Okay. So instead of saying true owner, which is what everyone wants to say, I, I would say he had possession blank A. Well, A had possession blank B. Prior. Prior, before. I would say A is the prior owner. Right? Everyone understand that, right? You want to say he's a true owner, he's a real owner? You don't know that. A could have stolen it. A could have bought it, maybe he inherited it. We, you know, we, we just don't know. And again, on an exam, I'm not gonna give you all the facts. All we know for sure is that A was a prior owner. A owned it before B. That's all we know. Okay, that's all we know. Hmm, okay. Bryce, I think you're next. What is B's claim um, to the watch? So whenever I found it, nobody had possession of it. Ah, oh, so like finders keepers, basically. Okay, is that is that an argument that's like insane? Is that just a completely irrational argument? I don't think so. No. In fact, most of you think finders keepers, right? You find a thing on the floor, you pick it up, it's yours. Right. So then, the, uh, Christopher. Then the question becomes: the question I ask is not who owns the watch, but whose claim is stronger. How would you go about answering that question? Just just with these simple facts, maybe just two sentences. Good cite the different schools of thought cited in our cases okay. that have some sort of legal authority behind both. Okay. What do you think the answer is? Who has a stronger claim? I think probably uh, A. Okay. Because I guess you would probably need to know a little more facts. That's all. I, that, look, and I'm telling you in the exam, I'm not giving you perfect facts. That, okay. That's just how it's going to go. Well, so but all you know here is that A had it first and B had it second. Yeah. Based on nothing else, whose claim is stronger? I would say A. Okay. I would argue that um, the case of the barbershop, the wallet left in the barbershop, uh -huh. and um, the person who found it there in the barbershop. Right. Now, now, this question is actually easy, right? The barbershop is complicated because what was it in the public property? Was it private property? This is simple. I'm giving you A and B. All right, Doug, what do you think? Is it A or B? Who's this claim is stronger? I think it's A. Okay, tell me why. Um, you have an original. Don't say original because you don't know if it's his. He might have stolen it. Uh, he had the most sticks in the bundle. How do I want you to describe it? Not original, not sticks, but what word do I want you to describe his, his possession? He had it blank B. He had it before, B. before or prior, yeah. And they, I, I don't want to be like pedantic on this. I don't want to be like nitty. But if you start saying original, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Because we, we don't know. He could have stolen it, but we know, right? A could be a thief. So I think what I'd say here is that A had prior ownership of the watch before B. And that, that's an absolutely correct statement. So let's see how we did here. Um, oh, that's very good. Yeah, so the answer here is A. Uh, I got 95, almost all of you got that right, so that's very good. Uh, almost some of you changed it, which sometimes does happen. I Don't change your answers. It's <laughs> I know people do it and whatever, okay. But, but the answer here is A, that's correct. And this is a simple question, because all you need to know is A had it before B. He didn't necessarily have it first, and, and I, I don't want you to use first possession, because that suggests he built it, right? He, you know, he, he bought it from a store. We, we, we just don't know those facts. He could have stolen it. You know, we, we, we have no idea. Okay? Okay? Well, very good in that one. Okay? All right. Any questions so far? So far? Uh, Blake and then, yeah. One, one two. So, I went with B. Okay. Because uh, who has a stronger claim to it? Mm. Okay. My reasoning being B had 
right to possession over everybody except A. So if A never came back looking for it, then he has a stronger right to it than everybody in the world. Oh, so you're saying that A never made a claim. So, yeah, I guess. Oh, I see what you're saying. Ah, so then how about this? What if I, you know, ah, how about this? A sues B for recovery of the watch. There I go, A. Ah, okay. That's fine. And, and indeed, I refine my questions year to year because invariably students think of things that I don't see. But everyone just, what, what Blake was asking, right? In the abstract, if A never tried to assert a claim, right, then A has zero claim. Is that basically what you're saying? Now, is that question clear up your, 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 okay, very good. We had a, um, a professor from another school come last, uh, uh, last week to our faculty workshop and give us a two hour lecture on writing multiple choice questions. And at the end, I'm just frustrated saying, I still don't know how to do it, right? <laughs> this is why I don't put these on my exam because you have a smart student come up with something, that's right, I didn't think of that. And it makes an easy question flip the other way. He's not wrong, but the precision to get these questions that you anticipate everything is something that I, I'm just not comfortable with. I, I think you have lots of smart students, or seven of you in this room. You know, think of things I didn't think of. All right, what else I get wrong there, uh, uh, Dylan? Uh, what else I screw up? I was up? just wondering if it made a difference because you said you can't assume that A was the true owner, but it says A loses his watch, not A wash. So oh, I just, yeah. That's, I just assume that you uh, that Look, if you steal something, you still say it's mine, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to, to, to drill you down in details, but in this class, don't presume that if you have something, it's actually yours. Okay. Presume you're a crook, you obtained it by fraud, you obtained it by theft, whatever you want. Especially when we get to land transactions, people convey property fraudulently all the time, at least in this class. But anyway, I, I don't like multiple choice questions, so I only do essay exams. It makes grading a lot, a lot more difficult. Man, if, if I could reuse multiple choice questions, I'd be in the clear. But, um, uh, but I, you know, Blake, I think, illustrated in, in a second why I don't give these on an exam, because I can't possibly conceive of everything. But this was not bad, 95%. Right, but but I, you, you're not wrong, you're not wrong. Okay, and actually I just updated my notes for next year. Okay. Questions? All right, uh, let's go on. Um, when you think about this topic, right, you should be asking yourself two questions, right? Not only who owns it, but when does he own it? Right? That is, you know, I might own it today and maybe I lose it tomorrow, right? Or maybe I own it today, but someone else had it years ago, right? Property is fluid. The same piece of property, whether it's watch or piece of land, can have different owners at different times. So this is a very much a sequential class, right? You have to start sorting people. Okay, A owned it first, B owned it second, C owned it third. And to be frank, they're all owners, right? They all, they all own it. They all have claim to the watch or whatever it happens to be, but they own it at different junctures. And depending how you sort that chronology, <coughs> this answer of who has a stronger claim changes. Okay? Everyone with me? All right, so let's do the first case. I think it's the shortest case. I'm sure you love this one, right? The shortest case of the entire year, I think it is. I haven't counted, but I think it is. Um, so, you know, you always remember Mary Poppins with chimney sweeps, and you think of like, you know, Dick Van Dyke. Um, they weren't adults doing this. And this is gonna be a little bit disturbing, but uh, they were kids, right? Why were children, usually young boys, selected to do the chimney sweep? Because they were small. And what they would basically do is they would get inside the chimneys, often stripping down to their bare clothes, or maybe even going naked, um, and they would shimmy up the chimney with these little brushes, and they would dislodge the soot from the chimney. Now, today, you have a vacuum cleaner, right? You just put a vacuum up there, it sucks all the stuff out. That didn't exist back in the day. Uh, here's some other pictures in, 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 from the States. Uh, this, was, this was morbid work, and I don't use that, that phrase lightly. Um, chimneys weren't always these straight things, you know, think of like Santa Claus, right? In these huge buildings, chimneys often had these kind of like, it's hard to see, but like these angles and sag. So you'd have to do all this. It would happen, imagine that if you're shimmying up a chimney, if your knees get too high, you get stuck. 
And if you get stuck, they can try and pull a rope to yank you down, or you suffocate and die. This was not, um, this was not light work. This was very dangerous work. Um, this picture actually illustrates it. Uh, uh, people died during this, right? OK. Now, that brings us to this case, right? The boy doing this, right, uh, 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 Master Armory, was probably uh, not from a wealthy family, right? I think we just assume that generally he wouldn't be doing this job otherwise. And that might explain why he was treated the way he was treated by the jeweler. All right, so Dylan, you want to give me the facts, please, in uh, Armory? Again, it's very straightforward facts, pretty, pretty easy. Armory was cleaning up the chimney and found the jewel, took it to the gold. Okay, let me just stop you there. Uh, were you a little skeptical when you read this, that he just found the jewel in the chimney? No, I mean. No? <laughs> really? Doug, you're shaking your head. I don't think he stole it. I, well. Or around the chimney. Okay, well, let's just put it this way, right? We don't know how he got it, no. right? Um, I'm cynical, I don't know, but I think this jewel probably was in the chimney. People have access to homes, find stuff lying around, but we don't know, right? We don't know. All right, so Dylan, he found this jewel somewhere, and what did he try to do? Did he notify the master of the house? No, he took no. it to the goldsmith, the defendant. Okay, so the jeweler took, it wasn't actually the jeweler, it was the apprentice of the jeweler, right? Mm -hmm. So the apprentice took the jewel, and what happened? He took the jewel out of it and gave it back to him. Or he tried, I think he gave, it a pri gave him a price for it first. Yeah, what was the price he, he gave? Oh, uh, three half pence. Okay, it's like a few pennies. Yeah. Right, it's like nothing. All right. The boy refused to take the money, and then they kept the jewel. Oh, okay. So again, uh, uh, name tag, sorry. Uh, oh, my bad. Alan. Alan, Alan, thank you. Alan, um, so let me just, again, this is probably a young boy, um, probably not very wealthy. He shows up at a jeweler with this really expensive jewel. What do you think the jeweler is thinking at that point when this little boy walks in with this really expensive jewel? Just, he stole it. He stole it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, this is like a pawn shop, right? If someone walks into your store, you're not asking questions about how he got it. So what do you think he offered the price for him? What do you think he was thinking would offer him that, that basic penny price? Well, 1722, he's probably really poor. Um, yeah. He's a chimney boy, so yeah. he's probably come from a poor, uh, poor household or yeah. doesn't have a structure. So I would just give him something he can go get a meal on and keep it pushing. Yeah. What do you think was going to happen, Alan, if... If you know he gave him too low of a price, you think he was gonna go to the cops on him? No. No. And that's actually an important point, right? The jeweler thought he had a free pass, right? Give the kid a few pennies, let him get a meal or something, right? And this goes away. Right? Because really all the jeweler actually was called the master of the house, and this guy probably goes to jail for a very you know, for, for some period of time. Now, did that happen, Jayla? Did the guy just go away? No. And what did he do? Yeah, okay, tell me what you're thinking next, yeah? took it as, like the way I played it in my mind, is the jeweler probably interpreted him, well not the jeweler, the goldsmith interpreted him to be like a fool. And so he just was going to give him anything and he yeah. was like, I mean, this doesn't belong Go to away. you, so you take this or take nothing. But um, he was like, no, give me, give me the jewel back. You know, I'll take it somewhere else. And yeah. Here we are. Now, <laughs> what, where did this case wind up? What court are we in, Jayla? Originally, we were, well, we ended up in the King's Bench. Okay, so just so you know, the King's Bench was basically the equivalent of the Supreme Court. That's the highest court in the land in the UK. Sheila, how is it possible that a poor chimney boy manages to litigate this case all the way to the highest court in the land? It makes me think that they used it as like a, a test case. Perhaps. Maybe. I don't know. I've, I've tried finding an answer and I've not found one satisfactory. Had this kid litigate the case, I'm guessing some lawyers took favor upon him, right, pro bono. I, 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 I don't have an answer for you. I, I don't know how those litigated to the highest court in the land. I just have no idea. But for whatever reason it was, 
right? That the lawyers decided to litigate this case up. And by the way, everyone knew what house this jewel came from, right? By going to court, he made it clear who he stole it from, right? In other words, this is why I think it was a setup, maybe a test case, I don't know, right? But the reason why I think this was a setup is because he had to make public where he got it from. And the master of that house would have known that he lost his jewel. Maybe he didn't care. Maybe he thought it was more important. The principal, you know, we, we, we don't know. I have no idea what the facts are, right? But these are weird facts, right? This is not the kind of thing that usually gets litigated. Yes, sir. Ah. Uh, okay, that's a good question. Who's next? Uh, did I do that side already? All right, Tony, I'll ask this question, right? So Tony, let's say you have this question that Alan just asked me, right? Let's say the master of the house comes forward and says, hey, chimney boy, that's my jewel. Is that an easy case? Is there any doubt how that one turns out? Uh, based on the time frame, I'd say no. Well, who would get it in the case that the master of the house comes forward? The rich master of the house. Why? Because it's the 1700s. No, wrong answer. <laughs> Under law, why is that the answer? Well, it, because he had it prior to Prior, that. very good. And I like the way you use the word prior. Exactly right. The prior owner, the master of the house, says, look, that was my jewel. The little boy stole it from me. It's mine. Right? If you're a thief and the original owner comes forward, it's his. But notice what we're talking about here, right? It's not between the master of the house, the prior owner, and the jewel thief. It's between the jewel thief and a second jewel thief. Right? Think about it. They're both jewel thieves, right? <laughs> this chimney boy stole it from the house, and the, and the goldsmith stole it from the boy. Right? They're both thieves, right? They both engage in bad acts. But who gets rewarded? The first person engaged in the bad act, not the second person engaged. This is like a weird thing, like you're rewarding thieves. People don't like this topic. They're very uncomfortable with it. But you, you have two thieves. They're both engaging in bad conduct. They both have unclean hands, especially the chimney boy, right? He, sorry, he engaged in the bad act first, so he's prior to the goldsmith. So therefore, in a dispute between the goldsmith and the chimney sweep, the chimney boy wins. But in a dispute between the master of the house and the, and the chimney boy, the master of the house wins. Right? Everyone get that basic holding, right? This case, I think, is the easiest of all the ones we've done today because it's simple, right? It's the prior in time prevails. So think of the sequence. Number one is the master of the house. Number two is the chimney boy. Number three is the goldsmith. Any dispute between the master of the house and the chimney boy, prior in time wins, number one wins. But in a dispute between the chimney boy and the goldsmith, prior in time wins, number two wins. Right? This is the easiest rule we'll do all day. Okay, everyone get the holding of that case? All right, Heather, one last point. What was the measure of damages the court ordered to be paid out in this case? Um, it says that it would be the value of the best jewels as the measure of the damages. What does that mean? So it's just, um, and like, cause the defendant, so the second jeweler that he took it to, like took the jewel, like the stones out. Right. And he didn't want to produce them to show like what the damages would be. Right. So they're saying that if you don't want to come and like show us what the jewels actually are, right. we're just going to assume that they're of the highest quality. Yeah, and exactly. And we'll have to pay them like more. Right, money. so we have the socket, right? We have the thing where the jewel was, which is basically like a brace. So we know roughly the size of the jewel. And the court says, okay, so let's just say, you know, it's, it's two carats, right? We'll assume it's two carats of the biggest diamond, in, you, know, uh, you know, clear diamond in the world, right? You know, whatever you, whatever you have. Uh, you know, this is basically telling the jeweler you're screwed, right? If you don't produce the stone, you're gonna be paying damages that you can't even quantify. Now, it's not even clear if he still had the jewel. I don't even know. He could have sold it. He could have made it in a jewel somewhere. So he might be the, he might have been the hook for a lot of money. You know, for all, for all we know, Maybe the master of the house put the boy up because he would get part of the money back away. You know, we could speculate. I, I really have no idea. But the damages were significant. Yeah? It's possible. It's possible. I, 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 don't, I don't know, but maybe he would get a cut of whatever the damages are, pay for the fees. 
I, I don't know. I, I've looked into it. I've not found a satisfactory answer. One thing you'll learn about these British cases is the case reports are complicated. Welcome to our next case, right? Uh, and let me actually explain this background point. You know, today when you read an opinion from an American court, it's very straightforward, right? The court writes a facts section, they write an analysis section, they write a holding, right? But the English courts were different. The reports that you read of English cases were not written by the judges. I said it again. The reports that you read of English cases were not written by the judges. The judges would sometimes announce their opinion for the bench. They'd read them out loud. And you'd have reporters, like actually, that's, what, that's, that's why they're called reporters, right? You'd have a reporter in the court writing down by hand what the judge said. Sometimes the judge would give them notes, sometimes they wouldn't. So when you actually see a report of an English case, it may not be what the judge actually said, it's what the reporter recalled the judge saying. That's why there are all these disputes about, well, the head note of this case, the head note of that. The reason why is it wasn't clear what the case is actually said. So you have these important legal distinctions turning what a reporter thought, and now what the judge actually said. It's a distinctly American practice to have the judges release their own opinions rather than having third party reporters create reports of a decision. Okay? Even the Duck case that we read, uh, 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 Keeble, that was not from the judges. Those were reports of the case. And there's some disputes about what the judges actually said because it's not clear. And sometimes reporters have biases. And the reporter might shift the case to account for their biases. It's just it's human nature. It's not, anything, not necessarily anything evil. So the British cases give you a lot of difficulty for that reason, because we don't know what the court actually said. OK, questions on that? All right. Go to page 55, please, in your books. There's some examples here we can walk through. Uh, I think Clayton, you're on deck. So if you go to, um, okay, so just read over here, starting F1 loses a watch. Okay, stop right there. F1 loses a watch, get earlier found. How did F1 come into contact with the watch? I know this sounds stupid, but how did he come into contact with it? Found it. Or stole it. Or yeah, exactly. We don't know how he found it. He found it somewhere. He didn't buy it. He has no paperwork, right? He found it. Maybe he stole it. Maybe he saw it in the ground. like, ah, that's mine, right? Okay, so Clayton. F1 found a watch. He loses it. And it's found by F2. Okay. Okay, keep going. Okay, this is basically the poll question I asked you guys earlier with a little, little wrinkle, right? Who wins here? Right, F and 1 had prior possession, therefore he prevails. And this is basically the same poll question that I gave you guys earlier. Okay. All right, let's try... Um, okay, very good. Let's try this one. I'm going to put it, I'm going to paste it for you up on the um, the class notes so you can see it. It's a, it's a slight variation. This is me for Tim. Okay. All right, I'll make a little bigger font. Okay. All right, so here's your question. F1 owns a watch and loses it. F2 finds it. Then F3 steals it from F2, okay? So I'm gonna ask you a series of questions, right? So the first question is this. F2 sues F3. Who wins here? Right, F2 sues F3. And by the way, F stands for finder if you didn't figure that out yet, right? F finder, right? That's right, okay. So F2 wins because he has prior <coughs> possession. All right, Tim, next question for you, right? F1 sues F3. Who wins here? F1. Yeah, he's prior. And then last one, F1 sues F2. Who wins here? Okay, very good. 
What these questions illustrate is that the earlier possessor always prevails in these sorts of cases. Um, don't get tripped up if it's F2, F5, F7. I will have many, <laughs> a lot of Fs on the exam, hopefully not like that, but just <laughs> a lot of finders. Um, F3 never wins, right? F2 is a stronger claim than F3, but a weaker claim than F1, right? So we want to rank it, F1 is the strongest claim, F2 as the medium claim, and F3 as the weakest claim. Yes, Elias? Is F2 the scenario that ownership? God, you know, that, that word ownership is so messy. I would rather say F2 has a claim to it that's weaker than F1, but stronger than F3, right? If you describe in relative terms, you will be okay. But if you say F2 is the owner, you're going you're gonna to get lost. So I wouldn't say that. Yeah, Grayson. One more time, I lost you in the middle. When make a di look, when I say F2 finds it, that can mean he steals it, okay. right? He just had it, he found it in the wilderness somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. But it could have been theft, right? So whenever you say find it, that's almost synonymous with steals it. Uh, yes, Ashley. And so that's going to be different from mislaying property. Okay. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the mislaid property matters when you have it in some sort of um, a public place where uh, the owner of some sort of shop okay. is trying to claim ownership. That if I just mislaid something in the wild, that's different. Yeah, from yeah. I don't want to get too far because that's just, it creates a different situation, but that's not really relevant here. Okay, everyone with me? Okay. All right, let's, let's, uh, okay, let's move on. All right, um, a, a brief note on bailments. Um, you'll probably never see this word again until we take the bar, uh, but it's a topic that comes up, so I'll mention it briefly. Um, a bailment is when you entrust your stuff to someone else. Right when you entrust yourself to someone else, we've all done this. When you give your keys to the valet driver, right, you're not giving him your car. <coughs> right. Usually, if you give your keys to someone, that means you're giving them your car. No, if you give your keys to the valet person, you're giving them a limited right to put your car in the lot and bring it back when you're done. When you give your, um, uh, you know, clothes to a laundromat, right, you're not giving them the clothes to keep. You're giving <coughs> them to clean it and then bring it back to you. Um, it's a temporary possession, right? So bailment does not involve found property, right? It's not, you can say, hey, I gave you these keys. It's like, whoa, I found these keys, my, it's my car, right? Bailment is like an exception to the fine doctrine, right? You, you, you can't claim that you found something if you received as part of a bailment. Everyone okay with that? All right, and there are two words that you may never see again, but I'll teach them to you now. Bailor and Bailey. And I want you to pay attention to the last two letters of this word, right? Bailor and Bailey. It's very often in property that words end in O-R or E-E. For example, grantor and grantee, mortgagor, mortgagee, lessor, lessee, Contractor, contractee, you may have seen these words elsewhere, right? Donor, donee, right? One of these is giving the bailment, and one of these is receiving the bailment. How do you remember which is which? I will give you the trick I learned in law school, I remember it to this day. When the word ends with EE, -E, think of like me, me, that means you're receiving it, right? So the bailee is receiving the bailment. Right, me receiving, right? The bail is receiving the, bail, the bailment, and the bailor is giving the bailment. So for example, if I give you my keys at the valet, I am the bailor, the valet person is a bailey. Okay? You will see this nonstop in property, you'll never forget it. You'll see grantor, grantee, lessor, lessee, it's the same words.
Okay. Is that a hand? No. Okay. All right. Again, you probably never see this ever again, but it, it's it's in your it, it's it's in your knowledge base now. At uh, one point, when you have a bailment, it imposes a duty of care, right? So you ever seen like Ferris Bueller or a movie like that, right? When you when you give your keys to a, a, a valet driver, they have a, some duty of care not to destroy your car, right? Or if you give your cl clothes to the cleaners, they have some duty of care, but not really. Whenever you give your valet keys, there's a little ticket they give you with lots of fine print, right? When you bring your clothes to the laundromat, fine print says, we're not liable for anything. So they basically disclaim their duty of care. But it's a common law if you get someone a bailment uh, uh, they had a duty of care. The more complicated one is what's called an involuntary bailment. And that relates to the cases we have today. Right? So let's say you're in a store and someone leaves behind an item and you hold on to it for their possession. As a, bail as a bailee, you have a duty to safeguard it and not destroy it. Right? In theory, if you leave someone, you leave your property somewhere and they just you know, destroy your item, you can sue them for violation of a bailment. That's not what happened in this case because the original owner never showed up. The first owner never showed up. So we don't have any bailment problems. But in theory, at least, right, if you leave a wallet or, 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 or a package of cash and then the owner just goes and spends it, the first in time owner can come back and sue for a bailment problem because they did not abide by the duty of care. Okay? That is not what happened. Don't pretend bailments are involved, but that, that could have happened also. Okay? Okay, let's go on to the next case. Um, Hannah versus Peel, the King's Bench, 1945. By the way, it's called the King's Bench because the monarch was a king. Today it'd be called Queen's Bench because now we have a queen. We've had a queen since actually not too long after 1945, Queen Elizabeth II, right? It, it's called King's Bench or Queen's Bench, depending who the monarch is, his majesty, her majesty, whatever it happens to be. Okie dokie. Uh, uh, Farron. You want to give me the facts, please, in um, Hannah uh, uh, versus Peel. Nope. Did you ever even go there? I don't think so. Nope. And what was going on during this time in 1945? Okay, let me just pause right there. What are these people fighting about, right? There's a war going on, right? The Nazis are walking across Europe and they're fighting over a stupid brooch. I cannot get this case. Like, don't you have more important things to be fighting about? Like, why are you doing this? I, I, I teach this case every year. I have just no idea. A, a 60 pound brooch, but I don't know. Print, people fight over principle really dumb things. During, but look, courts continue. The, the courts were open for business. All right, go on, Farron. Mm -hmm. And he took him to his wife, and his wife pretty much told him, like, oh, this might have some value. Um, and then he told a commanding officer, he came to give it to the police. Um, the police kept it for two years, and the real owner was never found, so then they gave it to Peel, the owner of the house, who sold it mm -hmm. for 66 pounds, I think. Yeah, not, not very much money. Mm -hmm. Okay, then what happens? And then... Um, they, uh, Hannah sued Peel because he said that um, Peel wasn't the real owner, so he didn't have a claim to it over Hannah. Okay. Okay, very good. All right, thank you so much, Farron. Um, all right, so where was this brooch found? It was found on top of a window frame covered with cobwebs, right, which tells us it was probably there for a very long time. I think that's a safe assumption to make. All right, cobwebs don't form overnight. Uh, we know that Major Peel bought this house, uh, uh, you know, uh, almost a decade before uh, this incident happened. And we also know that Hannah was, I think, a good citizen. Right? He found the stone. He gave it to his uh, commanding officer. Right? He wasn't trying to steal it. He was trying to, I think, do the right thing. But the police gave it to Peel. Then Hannah got pissed. He said, give me back. Give it back to me. Give it back to me. And Peel said, get lost. 
and he sold it for 66 pounds and eventually sold for 88 pounds. This is not a lot of money we're talking about. Um, so Hannah, motivated, decides to sue his commanding officer in the middle of World War II. I, I, just, I can't understand this. I just, it doesn't make sense to me. The blitz is going on, right? But I don't know. They, they had some sort of sentimental attachment to this brooch. Um, the defendant, Peel, says, it's mine. Right? Anything found in the house is mine. Hannah says, no, 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 I found it. So it's nothing to do with you. All right, the next part of the opinion, right, gets complicated. What the court does next is they walk through these various cases, right? And the court says there are all these precedents that are, if not binding, persuasive upon us. And basically, we don't really know how to reconcile these precedents. They're kind of all over the place. So let me just tell you what they are, and then we're going to make our enrolling at the end. That, that's a preview of what happens. Right? But the court says the law here is not settled. Right? It's not enough to say that the owner of the land wins against the finder. There's a lot going on here. So there are three cases that the court discusses. Bridges versus Hawksworth, 1851. South Staffordshire Water Company versus Charmin, and Eules, I think, versus Brig Gas. And the court walks through these cases, excuse me, one at a time, to try to make sense of the situation. Now, to be clear, we don't know who the prior owner was of this brooch. That person can be dead for all we know, right? No one showed up and said, aha, I owned that brooch before Peel bought the house. We, we, we don't know who this person is. So we're really left with two people. The person on the house who never even went there and the major who discovered it, or who found it. That's it. Those are the two competing claims. We don't know who F1 is. All we have is F2 and F3. Okay. All right, Mackenzie, walk me through the first case, this Bridges versus, versus Hawksworth case. What were the facts there? Good. Um, Work into a what? A business. A business, good. And when he was in there, he found um, some banknotes on the floor. Cash, yeah. And he owned, I think, like somebody who worked there, but he found them. Uh huh. And he told them to keep them until the, they could find the, out. So the person who found it told the owner of the shop to keep it? Yes. Okay. Until they found the true owner. Okay. And then they put out advertisements and such, never found the true owner, so he wanted to collect the bank notes, and they said no. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. Uh, I won't ask a show of hands, because I think I know the answer, but if you found a piece of money on the floor, would you just keep it, or would you hand it to the shop owner? I'm not going to ask. Uh, I, 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 I've done this before. I make people angry. Whenever I find money, I actually give it to the owner of the store. I was once at Shake Shack many years ago. And I found a 20 on the floor by the register. And I gave it to the cashier. I said, can you please tell us, hold on, if anyone finds it. I'm certain the cashier kept it. I, I, just, I, I, I have no doubt, but it wasn't on my conscience. But implicitly, I think here, the, the plaintiff did the right thing, right? Agree or disagree, I think he did the right thing. He found some cash on the floor. He gave it to the owner of the shop. He asked the shop owner, hold on to this. See if anyone shows up. Indeed, they put advertisements in the newspaper. That that's ambitious. I mean, I even t you tweet found twenty dollars. Right, everyone shows up. Right, and that's my cash. Right, I don't know. I don't know how that you prove it's yours. Three years elapse, and he remembered. Right, he remembered. I mean, that's a lot of. I I can't remember what he did yesterday. <laughs> right, so after three years, guy shows up. It's like, all right, where's my money? And he's like, Ugh. he spent it. Right, it was gone. The money was long gone. He spent it. All right. Now, a couple of points were made here. Right, uh, Allison, where exactly was this money found? Uh, Just be precise. No, you were right the first time. It was on the floor. Right, so Allison, when money's on the floor, just let's talk this out for a minute. 
do people usually put money on the floor? Like, like oh wow, the, let me put some cash on it, right? What do we usually think about money on the floor? What does that usually tell us? They dropped it, you know, maybe fell out of their pocket, right? People don't deliberately put money on the floor. Now, what about maybe money in a counter? How would you treat that differently? Yeah. Who here has left a credit card in a counter, right? Yeah. After you swipe, you just put it down, you, you, you fuss with your ID, right? Or if you're, you're at like TSA and you put your license down and you, right? You put stuff down on counters, on tables, right? Generally, people are not leaving cash on the floors. Right? Actually, I like the tap. I have another thing that you tap it because then you have to, it, you're less likely to put it down because it's always in your hand. Um, but you, you tap it, right? But here, you didn't have taps, so you only had cash. Um, so the court, explains that these were probably dropped by accident. All right? And the plaintiff here, the court says, did not waive title by letting the defendant hold it. Indeed, the court suggests that the shop owner was basically a bailee. That was basically holding the cash as part of a bailment for the plaintiff. Okay, which is probably right. He found it and he said, here, hold on to this. If the true owner shows up, the original owner shows up, give it to him, otherwise I'll claim it later. He came back three years later. That's probably a reasonable way to look at it. But now there's this other stuff the court discusses. Uh, Timothy, um, the court discusses, does it matter whether the money was found inside the shop or outside the shop? Does, does that make a difference? Okay, tell me why. Let's just say it's found on the sidewalk outside the shop, right outside the <coughs> shop. What would that suggest? Someone might have just dropped it passing by. Yeah, maybe it wasn't even going to the store. Now, let's say it's found on the floor inside the shop. There's probably somebody who stepped in. Yeah, yeah, Timothy, let me ask you this question, please. If you ever lose cash, what's the first thing you're going to try to do? Well, no, no, but, but how do you know where you lost it, right? Retrace you, you retrace your steps, exactly, right? You get home at the end of the day, it's like, crap, I don't have my cash. Let me retrace my, retrace my steps. So I was here, and I went there, and I went there, and like, okay, I had the cash here, but I didn't have the cash there, so I lost it you know, in this place, right? So people think, aha, if I left my money there, I'll call that shop. So in that case, the bailment argument makes sense. You let, let it sit where the person lost it. But the court here does not seem to say that it belongs to the shop owner because he owns the shop. Right? That's not what the court actually suggests. It's let the person who owns the shop hold on to it because the person who lost it will call back where they probably lost it. But in this case, that didn't matter, right? Because the plaintiff had the stronger claim, he found the cash. And then they, the, the court says later, there's a lot in dispute here. There's immense disputation. Great word, right? Immense disputation. Because there's nothing in the record about where the money was found. All we know is found on the floor. It have been found on the floor inside the shop or outside the shop. So the location in this case didn't actually make a difference. What mattered was that it was found on the floor, and the person who found it took it and gave it as a bailment to the shop owner to hold on to. I think that's probably the right holding. The stuff about the inside outside that just wasn't the case. Okay, everyone with me? I think I'm back down with Sarah. All right, Sarah, so the second case they talk about is South Staffordshire Water Company versus Charmin. Give me the facts there, please. So basically, the defendant is the possessor of land, and the plaintiff ha like operates a pool on his land. What do you mean, like a pool? Like a swimming pool? Yeah, it's not really clear. I think this is basically a lake, right, where they kind of just fill it up. This, you know, anyway, not, not important. All right, go on. So while they were cleaning the pool, they found two rings. Well, who, who, who is cleaning the pool? Just be precise here. So I think it was the plaintiff. Who is the plaintiff? The one that owned the, the pool. Mm -hmm. Who is actually doing the digging here? Who is doing the cleaning? Wasn't the defendant? I wasn't very clear. OK. Yeah, let me clarify. This The case is a little confusing. Um, the plaintiff here is the water company. The plaintiff here is the water company. The defendant is Charmin, right? So Charmin was the, was the worker. 
and he was ordered to clean up the pool. All right, so Sarah, what did, what did Charmin find at, in the pool? So he found two rings embedded on the bottom. Right, so this is important, right? The court makes a big fuss about this. The rings weren't floating around in the water, right? The rings were actually buried in the mud at the bottom of the pool. <coughs> uh, there was a story a couple years ago where someone had lost their class ring years ago and they found it in a pool somewhere. This stuff actually happens. They were, they were able to track down the person. Uh, so this stuff does happen, okay? So they found the mud in the bottom of the pool. Okay, at that point, Jasmine, what happens next? After, after Charmin finds the ring, does he hand it over to, his, uh, uh, to, to the water company? Mm, no, I don't think he does. No, he does not, otherwise he wouldn't be in court. What, what does he do? Oh, he does. And then what happens next? Catherine? The water company gives them a different bag. Okay, and, and, and what's the water company's argument why they get the jewels, the rings? Um, because they're his employer that he's an agent for them. No, 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 no. There's a, there's, a, there's a more important argument about why the plaintiffs here would get the rings. Because it was on their land. Bingo. Right. The plaintiffs own the property. They were what's called a freeholder. If you see that word freeholder, Freeholder means you own the property. That's what the word means. Like you're like a, a landlord, freeholder. That's what the, those words mean. The plaintiff, the water company, own the land. And they argue that, well, we own the land, therefore we can control who comes on the land, who goes off the land, right? We don't have to let Charmin onto our land, right? We can let him on the land to clean our pool, but anything he finds is ours. It's not, uh, Catherine, you're not wrong. It's not because there's employment relationship. It's not like a respondeat superior type argument. It's that they own the land and they let them onto the land. Whatever he finds is theirs, right? All right, so that's the argument, right? The plaintiff argues that anything that's on the land belongs to the owner of the land. Where have you seen this, Monique? You've seen a similar argument that we, we've had before. Where, where have you seen Th this sort of arg argument. Uh, very, very close. A different Latin <coughs> phrase, though. Um, Bingo. What's rationing solely? Uh, very good. This was a duck case, right? The doctrine, and I'll, I'll write in the board if you, if you can't see it, uh, if, if you don't remember how to spell it. I always spell this word wrong. I had to look it up yesterday to remind myself. Rationing solely. Rashing so solely means the rule of the soil, R-U-L-E, the rule of the soil. That is, whatever land, I'm sorry, whatever is found on your land, is found on your soil, belongs to the owner of the land. So the uh, argument here is that all the jewels that are in the land that are buried in the mud belong to the owner. Right? Even if the owner doesn't even know of their existence, right? The owner had no idea these things existed, but because they're on his land, they're his. Same way, you know, if you have oil or, or minerals or whatever else on your property and it's discovered, those are your reserves. Those are your, your, your valuable um, assets. All right. Now, this, uh, this ruling, Chelsea, is this ruling in conflict with the Jewel case, the Armory case? Tell me why. Okay, very good. The armory case was based on sequencing, right? The jeweler found it first, I'm sorry, the, the chimney boy found it first, and the jeweler found it second, right? That was a fairly straightforward case. But here, the pool boy found it first. The property owner knew nothing at all, right? This case doesn't turn the sequence which is found. It injects a wrinkle. It says, well, you might be the first one to find it, 
But if you find it at someone else's property, it's not yours. You see things get messy now, right? We had a really simple rule with the jewel case. The first finder keeps it, right? No, no more, my friends, right? It's the first finder keeps it unless he finds it with someone else's property, in which case the property owner prevails. Even if the property owner doesn't know, right? So with the jewel case, the master of the house knew it was his jewel. He probably just didn't want to go after the boy. We don't know. But here, there's no evidence they were aware of this jewel because it was buried under the mud. Yes, Tim. Um, I would say in Armory, somebody with prior possession didn't lay claim, but in this one... They are laying claim. Uh, are we, yeah, right, but, but the question is, how can you claim something you didn't know existed until it was found, right. right? With the jewel case, the master of the house knew the jewel existed, except it was stolen by the boy. Here, they didn't know it existed at all. Right, so again, the rule's starting to get messy. Right, the rule's getting messy. And, and they suddenly rely on the Bridges case. Right, he said, well, the Bridges case, the money was found in public, so that means you can get it. But if the money was found inside the shop, it belongs to the shopkeep. You see what they did there, right? The, 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 the Bridges versus Hawksworth case didn't really distinguish where it was found. It wasn't important. But here's the, ah, there's a distinction. We can reconcile the cases. Where the money is found outside the shop, it's in public. So the first finder gets it. Where the money is found inside the shop, it'd be different. Here, the stones, the jewels, were on side the property. Therefore, the first finder doctrine doesn't apply. So what this case does, the, 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 the water company case, is it creates an exception to the first finder rule. All right, the first finder keeps it, but if it's on private property, the owner of the property keeps it. They start making a mess of the cases here. Everyone with me so far? Yes, uh, Blake. Right, so the general rule so far was that the first finder keeps it, right? But there's an exception. The exception is if the first finder finds it on someone else's property, it belongs to the owner of that property. And I don't want you to write that in stone because it gets a little more complicated with the next case. I think Kinsey, you're next. All right, so Kinsey, let's look at the third case in this trilogy, right? Yules, I think it's Elwes Yules versus Brig Gas. What were the uh, what were the facts in that one? Um, so basically, there was land, and it was minus to a gas company for 99 years. Okay, just just pause right there, right? So most of you sign a one-year lease, right? What what's a 99-year lease? What's, what does that even mean? Does anyone back in those times live to be 99 years old? No. It's basically almost a permanent grant. And let me just mention this, right? You have some grants that are 99 years. For example, the Panama Canal was on a 99-year lease, right? Um, Hong Kong was basically owned by the Brits for 99 years. You have these things. It's not like forever, but it's almost forever for our purposes, right? And indeed, the Panama Canal has returned in the last decade. Uh, uh, Hong Kong returned to China about 20 years ago. Uh, so that stuff, that stuff happens. But the important point is, the land was given to the gas company. And the gas company can get whatever oils and minerals and things they find in the ground. Did the lease extend to other items found in the ground, Kinza? Uh, no. No. And let me just, I'll come back to you in a second, I promise. Um, when you have a reservation, which means that you're reserving certain rights for the um, oil company, stuff that's not mentioned in there it doesn't count. So let's just say all oil and gas. Right, let's say they find gold. That's not covered, right? So the question then becomes, what happens if something else is discovered? Right. What was discovered here? Um, they found a prehistoric boat. A prehistoric boat, what kind of random stuff is this, right? <laughs> it, was an, it was an old boat, I don't know, and they found the ground. Okay, what happened next? Um, so basically, they, um, <laughs> there was a problem as to who got the right to the boat, and so the court essentially said that it doesn't matter that the landowner didn't Okay, so who got to keep the boat? The plaintiff, who was the lessor. And who's the lessor? The person who owns the property. Right. Remember OR? What does that mean when you're OR? You're the same. See, I told you it was coming handy, right? 
the lessor, O-R, right, is the giver. And the lessee is the receiver. Is receiver of the lease. Very good. The tenant, you might say. Right? The lessor is a landlord. The lessee is a tenant. Very good. So in this case, we have this lease which involves mineral rights. They found a boat. Who knew, right? A boat in the ground. Uh, the boat was not covered by the terms of the lease. Therefore, the court says, it belongs to the plaintiff, the lessor, the landlord. Um, it was also on private property, and it was literally attached to the land. Man, okay. So then we have to go back to our case and try to make sense of these precedents. And they are not square. They are not clean. Uh, sorry, name? Uh, uh, Chris. Chris. All right. Try, if you can, to summarize, right? If you were to put these three cases into a rule, a rule statement, Lord help you, right? If you want to put these three cases into a rule statement, how would you summarize these cases? <coughs> For these, it seems like the summary would be that the property owner, even if it's unknown, Mm -hmm. has a stronger right, but then in the rule that they gave, that the court gave for summarizing mm -hmm. in this case, they said that if it's lost chattel, then the finder has a uh, stronger right. Okay. So, Mike, let me ask you this question. Do you own everything that's attached to your land under these three cases? Attached to your land. physically attached. I think that's safe to say. So I think the first rule you can derive is anything attached to your land is yours. doesn't matter who finds it. Right? And when I say attached, I mean attached. It's buried in mud. It's, it's in your land. It's, it's not just like floating around. Okay. Now, Joe, let me ask you a follow-up question, please. What about stuff that's not attached to your land? For example, a package of cash sitting on the floor, which is you know not attached. Does the owner of the property own cash that's sort of just sitting unattached in the property? Not necessarily. Oh, I like what you said. You said not necessarily. That's a good word. Why do you say not necessarily? Um, well, the court reasoned that it, a thing which is lying unattached on the surface on his land, even though the thing is not possessed by someone else, um, that they refer to bridges. Good. Very good. And I think, I think she said the answer correctly. It's not necessarily. It might belong to the owner of the property, but it might not. And that depends whether it's found inside the land, outside the land, a public place, and a private place, for all these distinctions. So again, the first part of the holding, I think, is you can say it pretty simply, right? Stuff that's attached to your land is yours. Doesn't matter who finds it. But if it's unattached to your land, it gets complicated. If it's found in a public place, I think it goes to the finder. If it's found in a private place, I think it goes to the owner. But even then, it gets a little m messy. We'll get to the Massachusetts case in a few minutes. All right. Everyone with me? Nicholas, so let's get back to the brooch, the frickin' brooch, right? Who owns the brooch after all these discourses through boats and rings and everything else? Who owns the brooch from the house? Um, it's going to be Hannah. Okay. Why does Hannah get it? They basically, they basically reason that because it wasn't fixated physically to the land itself, that it wasn't actually the possession of the property owner. Does it matter whether it was in a public aspect of the house or a private aspect of the house? It doesn't. Why? Uh, because they, they sort of reason that it was clear that the owner didn't actually know of any of its existence. Was Hannah allowed to go throughout the house as he wished? No, he wasn't. Was he? Was he allowed to be in the room he was in? In the room he was in, yes. Yeah. All right. I think part of it is that this was during war, and Hannah was authorized to be in this part of the house. And as a result, he could keep it. So the bottom line is that Hannah wins. He got his brooch and judgment for the plaintiff. Finder gets it. After all that lengthy discussion, Right. Now someone's going to ask Josh, but wasn't it covered in cobwebs? Wasn't it attached to the house? 
I think that's a reasonable argument. I always think that whenever I read the case. Like, you know, couldn't you argue those attached to the cobwebs? Well, I know cobwebs are kind of soft and you can rip them apart. I don't know. But this illustrates that the, this, this attached rule is kind of silly. But that's, that's what the court does. All right, questions in the first case? Uh, yes, sir, Elias and then Dylan. Yeah. Does it matter that these people were under orders to be there? Like the, the owner had given them permission to be there, and because of that. I, I think that was part of it. Uh, you know, I think someone said because he worked for him. I don't think that was the basis of the ruling, but it's connected. And, and let me explain why. Usually, you can't go into private property unless you're invited. Remember the licensee, I'm sorry, the invitee distinction? You remember, like, if I ask a plumber to come into my house, Okay, you can check out the bathroom, but you can't go to the kitchen, right? If I, you know, electrician can check the, the, the electrical box, but he can't go into my bedroom, right? Um, generally, you're on a person's property because you're authorized to be there for a limited purpose. And I think that does matter, right? If he wasn't invited there, he'd be committing a trespass. So the only reason why he can have a claim is because he was there in the first place under an invitation. I think that's part of the answer. Uh, yeah, Dylan. We just, we just said that. If it's unattached property and found in a private place, it goes to the owner of the house. Why wouldn't it go? Uh, to no, 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 not necessarily. So what's the exception there? Because the court doesn't really explain that, and that's why I tried to explain on my own. I think here Hannah had access to the entire house, so there wasn't like a private area. I think if the money was lost, and let's say there was a part of the house that Hannah wasn't able to access, at that point he would not have been authorization to be there. And I think the master of the house would have a stronger claim. Okay. Let, me, let me just explain that question one more time, make sure I do this as clearly as I can. I presume here that Hannah was authorized to be where he was. Right? I, that's my presumption. It might not be right, but I think it's a safe presumption. Let's say there's part of the house where Hannah was not authorized to be. I think in that case, when you have sort of a private area that this rule would not apply, that the master of the house would prevail. So that's why uh, Joe said a minute ago, not necessarily. I think it turns over if he's a public versus private, but even that distinction is kind of murky. The court doesn't draw it. That's how I explain it to my, my own mind. Yeah, Chance? When you look at access and authorization, if I give someone access to stay in a guest bedroom, mm -hmm. does that immediately get authorized them to take anything out of there? Um, I mean, no, I don't think so, but. Uh, but you're asking if they find, but it's not just take something, they found <coughs> something that no one knew it was there, right? If I have my own guest bedroom and I, I put furniture in and I put stuff in that's my own, in that case, there's no doubt that the master of the house has the prior ownership. What makes this case unique is that the major had no prior claim to it. He didn't even know it existed. I guess the, I didn't quite understand the sequence. So if the house was there, did he, the defendant own the house and then allow Hannah to access it? Yes. Him? So I mean, it, same thing, if I bought a piece of furniture and put it in that guest bedroom. Well, but he had no idea it was there, right? If you're putting furniture there, you no, can... You there's something in that furniture. I mean, that, that you're talking about access and authorization. So you're saying that you, you bought a piece of furniture and there was a jewel buried that you didn't know was inside the furniture? Yes. Um, that, that, that does come up. Imagine you buy an old dresser at an auction, right? And you don't check it out. And then buried it in the dresser like a hidden drawer. If you're going to put a piece of furniture in a guest bedroom, maybe that's one of the notes talks about could still have claim to possession of lost property. Yeah, that's Chase's question. Yeah, Chance's question. I thought the court was more focused on the fact that Peel or Hannah, yeah, he didn't have any idea that it was even there to begin with. So, like, he would never have. Found out about it unless Hannah found it first. Yes. So I thought that was more. That, that that that's that's true. Look, <sighs> let me explain. Let me answer your question this way. I can give you a, a very complicated answer to explain these cases, or a simpler answer. The, the way I think it's simpler is because of the um, the nature of we had access to the house. I think it's an easy way to explain it. If you want to explain it in different terms, in that he would have never found it, had Hannah never found it, that's also correct. But it doesn't jibe with what the court said. 
right? Because the court speaks about not whether you were found, the court speaks about not necessarily, right? And that key phrase, not necessarily, means there's an exception to the rule. And what's the exception? And the exception I think makes some sense is whether uh, he had access to that part of the house. And I know you're not satisfied. So if he was a trespasser, do you think the court would have ruled differently? I do. In fact, the court says he was commendable, right? They did the right thing. He turned over to the commanding officer, turned to the police. I think had he been a trespasser, I think it would have come out a different way. The defendant would have had no idea. I think so. Yeah, yeah Tim. something attached to private property, you said it belonged to the property owner. Belong as in like moral sense. The stronger claim belongs to the property owner. The strong, and not stronger, the strongest. If he never lays claim, when you said it is an exception, do you not get a, are you not put in the possessory life of that asset? When I say it's an exception, what I meant was they tried to run an exception to the Bridges case, right? The Bridges case didn't discuss who owned the property. But the, the Staffordshire case tried to say, oh, that case was about who owns the property. They tried to rewrite an old precedent to make it fit. That's run by the exception. So um, if the owner never lays claim, you become a This is Blake's right? If the, if, if the person with the strongest claim doesn't lay claim, then you have to consider claims down. down. We'll do the next case in a minute, see what happens there. The, the Massachusetts case is like, ah, we don't even know. Yeah, Dana. Um, I was just going to ask if you thought that because it was that decision, you needed to get your paid for it before, and he had not had the not interest in the house, but he had been renting it out or requisitioning. I don't know. Yeah, by the way, you know what a requisition is, right? It's during the war. Basically, the government says, we want to take over your property for a little bit. We'll pay you later. And that's basically what's happening here. Um, and the troops are being quartered in this premise. Um, so, so the short answer is, I, I don't think it really matters the acquisition. It was his house. He bought it. He was probably fighting the war. No, right? More important things to do. So I'm not sure it really mattered. Yeah, Blake? I looked at the requisition kind of similar to the Southford's, South Staffordshire Charming relationship. Even though he was an employer, employee. Well, yeah. did, did, because he's not giving them, what was, actually, I'm not even sure, was, was uh, Peel the commanding officer of Hanna? I mean, uh, Major is definitely ranked above Hanna, but were they in the same chain of command? And even if so, I think when you work for the government, it's a different deal. It's not like responding at superior. It's like you can't take whatever your subordinate does in the government the same way you could have a private employment. So I'm not sure if that analogy works perfectly. Then I go to another point of, or I forgot to mention, Hannah got the house, correct? Got the brooch. Sorry, mixing, mixing names up. Peel, Peel has the house. Right. So when he, when that freehold was conveyed to him, was not all of its contents conveyed to him as well? And if we're applying this concept to the brooch, what other it It's not attached. The argument is when you buy a house, you get whatever's attached to the land, not sitting on top of a windowsill. Yeah, does the land, okay. It's the important part, it's got to be attached. That's a key word. And the brooch here is not attached. I just feel like this precedent just sets, sets the ability for those soldiers to have taken anything in that house if they wanted. Yeah. Quite literally. Yes. 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 I mean, maybe that's a cost to letting people live in a house you've never inventoried. I mean, I know that sounds stupid, but this was a question before about the hidden jewel in a, in a dress you buy at an auction. Maybe you should investigate before you let people come to your house. I mean, you know, I, th this might sound insane, but, you know, if you have, if you, if you buy a house and you haven't really, you know, you, and you inherit the furniture, you might check it out before you let people stay there. Because if you don't, you might lose it. All right, let's do the last case. I know, I told you. Unsatisfying, right? <laughs> Confounding, I promise you it would be. Uh, Jordan, I think you're next. Jordan, do you want to give me the facts, please, in the last case, McAvoy against Medina, Massachusetts, uh, 1866? By the way, middle of the Civil War. I mean, I mean, basically, like, Civil War is just winding down, things going on, and people are talking about this thing, right? Okay. Okay, so the plaintiff was a customer in the defendant's barbershop, 
And while he was there, he found <coughs> a pocketbook which was laying on the table. Okay, so just just be careful, right? It was a barber shop, and they found a pocketbook that was on the table. So generally, Jordan, if you see a pocketbook or a purse on a table, what would you suspect the what would you expect happened? That another customer left it there. They put it down. They forgot it, right? All right, go on, please. Um, so the plaintiff basically points it out to the defendant. Good. And then places it back where he found it. Okay. After that, the defendant came and picked it up and counted the money that was inside. Okay, this is the shop owner, by the way. All and right. And then the plaintiff told him to keep it. And if the owner of the pocketbook came to give it to him and to otherwise advertise it, uh -huh. and the shop owner promised to do so, um, after that, though, the plaintiff made several demands for the money that was inside the pocketbook. Nope. Did he ever come up with it? No. Okay, very good. Um, so this case gets another turn. Right, so there's a purse sitting on top of a table, has cash in it. It's a safe assumption that someone just left it there. They, 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 they put it there and they forgot and they walked away. They never came back for it. Or maybe they did, we don't know. It's possible, I mean, like, just let me pause here. It's possible the owner came back and the shop owner was like, nope, we never found it. I mean, we don't know, but I mean, this guy seems like not the most honest dude. He's like, yep, no, we never found it. So then he just disappeared. So the only people who knew about it then were the plaintiff who found it and the shop owner, the defendant. Okay, so at some point, the shop owner sues, I'm sorry, the, 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 the plaintiff, the finder sues the shop owner. All right, Ashley, what happens here? Okay, why? Okay. And made a distinction between leaving it on a table versus leaving it on the floor. Yeah, it gets more complicated, right? So they said the Bridges case, right, the Bridges against Hawksworth case, that was about lost property because the money was on the floor. This case is not about lost property. It's about forgotten property or mislaid property. Again, I want you to get that note in your notes clearly, right? They say Bridges was about lost property, and this case was about either forgotten or mislaid property, right? It was placed on the table, but they forgot it, or they just put it down, they, 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 they walked away, right? Did Bridges say anything about mislaid versus lost versus forgotten? Of course not. But what the court's doing here is they're carving out another exception to a very old case. Say, see, look, we are consistent with that case, but we're distinguishing it away, right? It's a different rule. That's what courts do that drives the lawsuits nuts. They make these distinctions that are razor thin that don't make any sense. Okay. So here, because the property was mislaid rather than lost, the owner is the, I'm sorry, the stronger claim will be the shop owner. The shop owner is the strongest claim. Right? And the court gives some explanation that does make some sense. Right? Jay, if, if someone did in fact lose money in the shop, where would they go to try and find it? The shop, right? They'll try and retrace their steps. So in that case, who's the best person to hold on to the cash? The shop owner. Okay. And what happens if the true owner shows up? What happens at that point? Uh, they're going to say, where's my wallet? And then? And then the shop owner, uh, this shop owner, <laughs> I don't know about this one. He seems kind of shady. Yeah. Hopefully in theory, right? Respect the entrustment. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the bailment. bailment. Yeah, the bailment, right? So the, the, the court's analysis is basically based on bailment, right? When the money is lost in the shop, Treat it as an involuntary bailment. Let the shop owner hold on to it so that when the true owner shows up, he can reclaim it. Now, I think here he lied and just never did it. You know, in the, in the Bridges case, put an advertisement in the newspaper. They made good faith to recover it. Here, right? There were no efforts here. It's like, all right, whatever. I'll just put it in my wallet and go home, I think. But the bottom line is the plaintiff acquired no right to the money. Even though he was the finder, the plaintiff up this. He had zero. So then the court gives this holding, right? A finder of property acquires no rights in mislaid property. 
is entitled to possession of lost property against everyone except the true owner and is entitled to keep abandoned property. <coughs> One more time. A fine, you're welcome. A finder of property acquires no rights in mislaid property, is entitled to possession of lost property against everyone except the true owner, and is entitled to keep abandoned property. That rule's wrong. I know you're going to be mad at me. I, I was waiting for it. Because that rule only talks about bridges. It doesn't talk about Charmin versus uh, uh, Stratfordshire versus Charmin. And it doesn't talk about Eels versus Brig Gas. Because it doesn't talk about whether the property is attached to the land. Because if it's attached, it belongs to the property owner, <coughs> not to the finder. So even the abandoned rings, which are buried at the bottom of a pool, or an abandoned boat buried in the bottom of the soil, right? It doesn't go to the finder goes to the property owner. So even this beautiful one sentence summary I gave you from the case is wrong. Because it doesn't account for the other two cases, the Charmin uh, versus the Staffordshire and the, 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 the Eels Brig. Yeah. If you were to attach to, or if you were to also add not attached property. Oh God, it'll make it even more complicated, right? But you see what I'm trying to tell you, right? There's not a single rule. There's no one rule for this class, right? Even this Massachusetts court, which is I think much easier to read, a lot easier to read in my mind. Tries to neatly tidy it up, and they only account for half the precedents. So you have to keep in mind all these things, right? I, I, I'm going to re regret giving this to you, but I'm going to do it anyway. I do it every year, and I regret it, but it's better than nothing. So this is the way I think of it. It's not easy. This is how I think of it. It's not easy, but I'm going to try to give this to you so you at least have it in mind. It will create more questions than it's worth, but I think it's better than nothing. Josh, how do you summarize today's class? Okay, let me try it, right? If it's attached to the ground, it belongs to the property owner. And this comes from Charmin and Briggs. If it's unattached to the ground, we ask, <laughs> is it lost? For example, it's on the floor. I think Bridges provides a rule there and the finder gets it. But if it's misplaced on a table, for example, like in McAvoy, the property owner gets it. There are problems with this also, because I don't draw a line between public versus private. Um, it's, it, it's not perfect, but it's the best I can do with these, with these five cases. Five, is it five? One, two, three, four, five, uh, close enough. Yeah. Okay, Chase. Uh, I'm sorry. I keep saying Chase. I'm sorry, Chance. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I, I know you told me it happens, but I keep doing it anyway. I'm sorry. I, I use Chase Bank. I don't know. It's in my head. <laughs> Go on, Chance. Can things change, I guess, status? Like, if it's, you say, instead of a, say you bumped the table, so it was, it was misplaced until the table goes on the floor. Now, is it become lost? And look, look. That, that let, me, let me put this point very bluntly. If you are the finder, Right? And you know this rule is saying, huh, if it's on the floor, it's mine. If it's on the table, it belongs to the shopkeep. Knock it over. Right? This is a very bad rule. This is a terrible rule that rewards misconduct so easily. Right? Who the hell knows? Oh, I found it on the floor. Look at that. It was on the floor. Right? It was on the floor. No one even knew it was there. Right? So this rule encourages self dealing, so to speak. Right? Yeah. yeah. Is it really as strict as? On the floor, on the table. Because what if, like, someone just dropped their wallet walking out of the store? It's in the middle of the floor, and it was pretty obvious it wasn't there for like a long time. So it's something that could have been displayed. Or just on the floor. Look, these are not bright line rules, my friend. They're not. Um, this distinction between misplaced property or mislaid property and lost property is very thin. And you can come up with 100 examples of which is which. And again, you're now in a dispute between two dishonest people, right? Right, you, you, you basically have two people laying claim to the same property without the prior in time owner showing up. So it's very messy. Yes, Dylan? Under this rule that we discussed, it's good. I have a lid for a reason. Yeah, go on. Could you argue that the brooch was misplaced because someone intentionally placed it there? So it wasn't lost? Who would put a brooch on top of a windowsill? 
Maybe like, someone's hiding it. I don't know. It hiding spot. You put jewelry in an obscure place. I don't know. It's possible. But the 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 Hannah versus Peel case didn't consider this distinction between um, misplaced and lost property. I mean, I don't know that the English courts were reading decisions from the Massachusetts court in the 1860s. They probably didn't even know about it. Uh, yeah, Blake. Uh, then we go into the fact that it's probably abandoned because the person that put it there has sold the property because it's now under the freehold. Right, and to Dylan's question, if you put a piece of jewelry there and you forget it and you sell the property, if you abandon it. Right, the abandonment part, they kind of throw it at the end, and we don't really talk about that. But when you, when you say you abandon property, what does it mean to abandon it? You forget about it, or you really forget about it? You didn't give anybody else the right to get to it. Yeah. Questions? All right, let me try it. Oh, yes, yeah, Sarah, please. So, um, if something is misplaced, then it belongs to somebody other than the property owner, you said it can be treated the as finder. a if it's if well no no if if it's if it's misplaced it belongs to the property owner. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The the, 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 the prior time owner always has a superior claim, right? So the person who misplaces while it comes back it's his, but the question between the finder and the property owner, right? That's what these questions are about. Yes, uh, uh, Clayton. So if I, I own the pond. Therefore, you own the what? I own the pond. The pond. Okay. Because like, I own the land the pond is on. Okay. So therefore, I own the fish or whatever in the pond because regardless, I don't know how many fish I have, I own the fish. So then I own whatever else happens to be in there, including rings or whatever. Right. So the rationing solely doctrine means you would own the fish on the ponds in your land. Yes, that's correct. Okay. That's what I'm trying to say. And as well, you own the, well, the only difference is you know there are fish there because it's, <coughs> it's a fish pond. You don't know the rings there, which is why it became a conflict between the, the, the finder. But then I don't, I don't necessarily know exactly what kind of fish or how many of them are. Uh, no, no. You're aware there's wildlife in the, in the pond, but you're not aware there's a buried ring there or a buried boat, for example. Uh, I told you this class would not be exciting, or it would not be satisfying. I, it happens every year. Let me try to, I have about a, a couple minutes left, let me try to summarize uh, as, as best as I can. Um, when you're thinking about found property, uh, you should generally start by thinking the sequence, right? Finder one has a claim over finder two. Finder two has a, claim over, uh, has a strong claim over finder three, right? That's the first thing you think about. But you also need to think about is where is a property being found? Is it being found in a public place? Or is it being found in a private place, right? And if it's being found in a private place, is it attached to the land? Or is it just sitting on the land? Right? Those are not bright rules, but it will help you get to the right answer. Uh, I have some old exams that ask questions about this. I test on this a lot because uh, I like students go in different directions. There's usually not one right answer. Usually it's, it's fairly, you know, a uh, chance asked about knocking something off a bookshelf. I haven't used that example before, but that's the sort of thing I would ask about, right? Um, there are lots of ways students can take this, so I enjoy testing on it because it, it, it allows you to take different directions. There's not one right answer. There's usually many possible right answers, but something I do enjoy testing on. Enjoy is the wrong word, but I do like using it as a question because it helps those people think about different options. You know, this little, if it's this and this and this and this, it helps you think it through, okay? Any questions? All right, I'll be in my office after this if you want to come talk. Otherwise, I will see you guys on Thursday. Real quick question. So when it came to all like the oil 